Good morning. Welcome to all of you gathered here in the sanctuary and to those watching, welcome to you as well. It's good to be in God's house together. Another week has passed, another week begins. We end our week, we begin our week here as God's people gathered in his presence to be renewed and refreshed, to be reminded of God and his love for us. We're also reminded that Jesus Christ is our King. He reigns over all things. He reigns over the universe that is created by him and through him and for him. And our call to worship comes from Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, people under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of the trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations, God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham, for the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. We're here to sing praises to God, to sing praises to our King. We're here to exalt our God's most glorious name. Let's do that together. We'll stand together and sing when our opening song will be Behold Our God. We'll follow that after the greeting with Lift High the Name of Jesus. For We are here to proclaim the name of the Lord, the one who rules and reigns over all the nations.
People of God, receive a greeting from our great and glorious God who is on his throne. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and our Father, to whom be the glory with the Son and the Holy Spirit forevermore. Amen. We sing, lift high the name of Jesus. read from Psalm 130 as our call to prayer, call to confession. The writer of this psalm recognizes the depths of sin in his heart, soul, recognizes how broken he is, and how dare could he stand before God, and yet we are invited to God because we are his children, invited before his throne. So hear these words as God's invitation to you to approach his throne of grace and mercy. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. 
I will wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. As God's people through faith in Christ, we are his new Israel, and these words are words of God's truth to us as well, that we put our hope in the Lord, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished, then we can expect God's unfailing love to shower us continually. We can expect from him full redemption. God will redeem us from all our sins. Let's bow before God in a moment of prayer. Gracious God and Father, merciful Lord and Savior, we bow before you and we cry to you from the depths of our hearts. We cry to you because we are sinners who sometimes hopelessly cannot leave the sin that is in us behind. We continue to grapple with and deal with temptations, Lord, that continue to trip us up. We continue to focus on things of this life, this world, rather than the things of your eternal kingdom. And the King, the eternal King, Jesus Christ, we, we do not fix our eyes on him. And so we, we trip up in life. We, we wander from your pathways of righteousness. We confess all this to you, O Lord, as your children. We confess that our hearts are not always completely drawn to you, but they're drawn to the things of this world, and that leads us into sin. We know we could not stand before you if you kept a record of our sins. And we thank you that your word assures us that as far as the east is from the west, you passed away, you remove our sins from us, our transgressions are removed and taken away, and you don't see them anymore. That all happens through faith in Jesus Christ, and so we thank you for the mercy and grace we have in him, for the faith that you give us to believe in him, Lord. If we are not a person of faith yet, bring us to that point, Lord, where we trust Jesus completely, where we rely on his finished works and not on our own, to find forgiveness with you, to find full redemption, to be redeemed from all our sins. Pray, Lord, remove the sin from us, the guilt and the shame that those sins carry, cause within us that we carry with us through life. Help us to see ourselves as your new, redeemed children, alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. We're going to sing the words of Psalm 130, the song, I Will Wait For You. You can remain seated as we sing this song.
God in His Word calls us to wait upon Him, to rely on Him for our strength, to look to the Lord to be renewed so that we can walk as His people. We hear this call to discipleship, call to follow Jesus Christ from Mark's Gospel, chapter 8. Then Jesus called the crowd to Him along with His disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. It's a tall order that Jesus calls his people to, but we don't do this in our own strength. We do this in the strength of the Lord to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow our Savior. We do this the best we can each and every day, relying on the Holy Spirit to empower us and to look to Jesus Christ who gives us the example. Let's sing about that one gospel. Salvation we have in Jesus Christ. We'll gather, or we'll stand and we'll sing. There is one gospel.
little bit of musical chairs, but you've all found a spot, right? Good to see you. Someone's yawning. You're a little bit tired, Nolan? <laughs> That's all right. Sunday mornings can be a little bit sleepy, right? You're not going to school. It's kind of relaxed. But I'm glad to see you guys here. It's good to be here, right? It's good to sing songs of praise to the Lord Jesus, to sing that gospel story about how he died to rescue us, right? To save us. So you guys are going to go off to Sunday school, and you're going to study a Bible story. We're going to talk about Jesus calling his first disciples here in the sanctuary. We're going to talk about Jesus calling Peter and Andrew, James and John. All right? You can ask your parents about that later. But before you guys go off to Sunday school, before you study the Bible, and we study the Bible here, let's pray like we always do. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for that old story, that old gospel story. That I hope and pray brings each and every one of us joy to our hearts, assurance and faith, assurance of salvation that we have through faith in Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that as we study your word now here or in Sunday school or after church in Sunday school, Lord, that that good news of Jesus may come clear to us, whether we're young or old, that good news story may fill us with joy and peace with gratitude, so that we can go forth and live for you, Lord Jesus. For you are our King, you are our Savior, you are our Master. Help us, Lord, to long to follow you more and more each day. So bless us in this time of study, in this time of worship, so that we can grow to be your people. What we are lacking, give us what we need to have removed, take away from us, Lord, so that we can be the true sons and daughters of God the Father Almighty and true followers of you, Lord Jesus. We pray this all in your name. Amen. All right, now you can stand up, face all the people. Close enough. That's good. Let's bless the children, saying, The Lord be with you. Thank you very much. It was a chorus again, like last week. All right, you guys can go off to Sunday school. I invite those of us staying here in the sanctuary or watching to turn to Matthew's Gospel. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4, we'll read verses 18 through 25. Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 18, page 1500 in our pew Bible, 1500. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogue, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds, followed, or large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you've been with us for these past few months, you'll know that throughout these first four chapters of Matthew's Gospel, he's been proving to his readers that Jesus is the long-foretold king. God promised David that 
one of his descendants would come and rule on his throne forever. Jesus is David's heir, who is the forever and eternal king of God's people. But Jesus is not just an heir of King David, not just the eternal king of a single nation, Israel. Jesus would also become the king of the nations, king of the world. Jesus becomes king of the nations in fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. God promised Abraham that he, God, would bless Abraham or bless all the nations through Abraham. We find God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. God says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God repeats this promise to Abraham, even to Isaac, several times throughout the book of Genesis. Abraham and his offspring would bless all peoples on earth. Matthew also points out in his genealogy of Jesus that Jesus is the long-awaited heir of Abraham. And so as the son of David, Jesus is the eternal king. And as the son of Abraham, Jesus is the global king. Jesus is God's promised Messiah King who rules and blesses the nations forever. Last week we looked at Matthew's quotation of Isaiah 9, when Isaiah prophesied about a great light coming to a deeply darkened world. A great light comes from God. That's because the great light is God, God the Son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah King. King Jesus begins establishing his kingdom of light in our sin-darkened world. And he begins in Galilee of the Gentiles, just as Isaiah said and Matthew highlights here in his Gospel. We're not going to review all of what we considered last week, so you can rest easy. But I think it's worth hearing, again, the Isaiah quotation in its fuller context. Matthew wants his readers to know that Isaiah was pointing to Jesus. And so Isaiah prophesies this, Nevertheless, There will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, God humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles, by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Why? Because for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The rule of Isaiah's child king starts at a specific time and in a specific location. The eternal and global king's rule has a beginning in history and a location. But his rule and his kingdom, it grows from a specific time and a specific location to encompass all time and all space. Jesus Christ's rule, it is eternal and it is cosmic in scope. The global and eternal nature of Jesus' rule and his reign, it is key for us to know as his followers. Matthew is making sure that his readers understand this, that they can see this. In fact, the whole Bible speaks and reveals the global scope of Jesus' reign and rule over the nations. Yes, Jesus is a personal Savior, and we talk about that every week when we gather. We'll look at that again shortly when he calls individuals to follow him. But Jesus saves individuals in order to incorporate them, build them into his global and eternal kingdom. God is no respecter of persons in terms of their ethnicity or their nationality. Abraham was a pagan nobody before God called him. And for a time, God's focus was on Abraham and his descendants called Israel. But that was only for a time. God brought into his kingdom the nations. He brought foreigners into his family. We saw that when we looked at the genealogy of Jesus. And the arrival of the wise men, the pagans from a far-off land, also shows this. And the fact that Jesus, King Jesus starts proclaiming his kingdom message and building his kingdom 
army in the Galilee of the Gentiles, it also proves that God is bringing foreigners into his family. As I said, Jesus is a personal Savior. We need to know that a sinner can only be saved personally by coming to faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. No one is saved from sin and eternal punishment by genetics or bloodline. No one is saved from sin and eternal punishment by association or by membership. We each must personally believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior in order to be saved. But once saved through faith, that's when Jesus Christ, our King, calls all those who he saves to be part of his kingdom, to be part of his army. In the Lord Jesus Christ's army, it is indeed global and eternal, just like his kingdom and his rule and his reign. The start of Christ's global army begins with the call and answer of four ordinary men of no account. King Jesus calls four fishermen as his first soldiers. Simon Peter and Andrew, James and John, they're all going about their business. Jesus comes to them, and he calls them to follow him. This is more than just an invitation. It's more than, hey guys, let's go spend some time together. I've got some things to tell you. No, his follow me is a command. It's the command of a sovereign, a king. When he says, follow me, he expects obedience. And that's what the four do. The four respond to Jesus, the king, obediently and immediately, as Matthew points out. When he says, at once and immediately, they left their nets and their boats. In the case of James and John, they left their father and they followed Jesus. Matthew deliberately notes that they respond without hesitation. Now, the four had likely heard from John the Baptist about Jesus, the one whom John was sent to herald and announce. Scholars are quite sure that this is not the first time at least some of these four men had encountered Jesus. Andrew and likely John were the disciples, or were disciples of John the Baptist, as we read in John chapter 1. And we know from John's gospel that Andrew told his brother about Jesus when he said to Peter, we have found the Messiah. So the four knew about Jesus. They knew that Jesus was the prophesied Messiah King. And so yes, in our text, they may drop everything in the spur of the moment to follow Jesus. But Jesus' call and their obedience to follow him, it's not something that comes out of the blue. They don't blindly follow Jesus. They've learned enough about Jesus for Jesus to come along and make their, this call to discipleship. And they answer his call. They become Jesus' disciples. They become his students. Jesus will teach them the kingdom way of life. They will learn what the kingdom of God is all about. They will learn what kind of king Jesus is. And Jesus will train them to be leaders in his kingdom. It's true their education won't be taken to heart until after Jesus is crucified and risen. They couldn't get their heads around it we probably wouldn't have been able to either until after. But it's after when they see the risen Lord Jesus and he opens their minds that they fully understand. They fully understand, they follow Jesus, and they will also follow his example of sacrifice. Now Matthew doesn't give us any personal details about the four. Who they are is not as important as who called them and their response to the one who calls them. We do find out more about the disciples as Matthew's gospel goes on. Many of Jesus' disciples are executed for being Christians who proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord and King over all creation. John is the only disciple that we know of who lives to an old age, but he dies as a prisoner for the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to become a disciple of Jesus? It means giving your life to Jesus. It means accepting whatever specific challenge and call that Jesus has for you and me as individuals. For the four fishermen, they had to leave their livelihood, their families, behind. And for many of Jesus' early disciples and followers, and for the early Christians in the church, following Jesus was often a death sentence. Being called to follow Jesus, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's not done in complete ignorance. Christ Jesus and the gospel are presented to people through the Bible 
and through other Christians, God reveals who Jesus is to people. And at some point then, if it's God's will, he issues a call to these people who've heard the gospel about Jesus, and that call is, follow my son, follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I think I can safely say that every one of us here has heard about Jesus and who he is, at least more than once. We've all been presented with enough information and proof of who Jesus is. And God has issued the call to every one of us to follow Jesus. But not all of us have answered that call. We've not all obeyed the call to follow Christ. So we need to each ask ourselves honestly, am I following Jesus? Am I a disciple, a soldier of Jesus Christ, the King? Again, what does it mean to be a follower and a soldier of Jesus Christ, the King? Being a follower of Jesus means accepting whatever task, whatever mission that he's given to you and me personally. For some of us, that may mean a radical change in life, like Jesus' disciples. But for most of us, that means living our lives and carrying out our roles in Christ-like ways. Followers and soldiers of Christ the King are to live and serve like Jesus Christ. And we serve Christ through our relationships, through our work, our education, our schooling, the use of our time and our talents. In every way, we are called to serve Christ. And if we have true faith in Jesus Christ, then we have answered the call to follow me that Jesus issues. But again, we each need to be examining our lives. We need to assess how well are we following the Lord Jesus. We need to be honest with ourselves and with the Lord. And we need to ask, am I truly following Jesus in every area of my life? Am I living for my king and his kingdom? Or am I living for myself and my own personal kingdom, my own personal gain? To be a true follower of Jesus, there must be several key important markers in our lives. I got these from Pastor James Boyce, Presbyterian minister, many years ago. He notes these characteristics of those who are truly following Jesus. The first one he mentions is obedience. Obeying Jesus and his call to live like him no matter the cost. Jesus may require that we give up our jobs, contracts, relationships, worldly success, and many other things to follow him. If he has, have we obeyed him? Repentance is another key characteristic of following Jesus. Jesus must be Lord of our lives, not us. We must confess and believe that I am not, sorry, part of following Jesus is killing the sin in our lives. If we are willfully living in sin and saying that we are following Jesus, that doesn't work. The two are incompatible. That doesn't mean we don't trip up. It doesn't mean we are perfect. We know that we can't be perfect yet on this side of heaven. But if we're easy with the sin in our lives, then we aren't truly following Jesus. The third characteristic of someone who follows Christ is submission and humility. Jesus must be Lord of our lives. We must confess and believe that I am not my own, but I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust is another marker of one who's following Jesus. True followers of Jesus trust him with their lives, their whole lives. Do you, do I, trust Jesus with our lives? Or are we trying to be the guardian and the protector of our lives, which is a fool's errand because we don't know what will happen a second from now, five minutes from now. We need to trust that if we are followers of Christ, he holds us in his hands and he will never let us go. And the final characteristic that James Boyce notes is perseverance. Following Jesus is hard, at times almost impossible in a world that hates him and hates his followers. When the going gets tough as a Christian, we need to persevere. We must not give up. As Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Mark wrote in his gospel the words of Jesus about not being ashamed to name Jesus as our Lord. That's a call for all Christ's followers. We must boldly wear the name of Jesus. We do that by living out a life of service to him. We discussed how, last week how Jesus Christ is the light of the world, how he came to defeat the darkness. That darkness comes from the evil 
the sin that is around us, but also within us. To be a follower of Jesus Christ, the light, we have to fight the darkness around us, but also, probably more importantly, within us first. There's a war going on all around us. It's the war between good and evil, between light and darkness. And we can try to live on the sidelines of this war. We can try to stay far away from the battlefront. We can do all we can to avoid active combat. But this war is raging on nonetheless. And we are in this war whether we think so or not. If we're not fighting for Jesus Christ and his kingdom of light, then we are useless to Jesus our King. And if we're useless to our King, then we're being useful to Satan, the prince of darkness. Complacency, trying to sit on the fence, that only helps the side of evil, the side of darkness. Trying to maintain a neutral position so we don't offend society, that is not being faithful to the Lord. And trying to get by in life so that society will like us, that's not being a soldier in Christ's army. And if we try to do this, avoid active duty, try to sit on the fence, if we avoid actively shining the light of Christ in this world of darkness, the darkness will take hold of us nonetheless. King Jesus calls each and every one of us to live in and to promote the light of Christ, the light that he is. And we also are called to promote the light of God's word, which tells us all about Jesus. And that's why Christ Jesus saves sinners to bring them from sin and death into his kingdom of life and of light. God saves people to serve Christ the King as his soldiers of light. And so if we claim Christ as our Lord and our Savior, we must be doing our part to shine forth the light of Christ. And if Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Captain, we need to serve him not just a little bit, but with our all, our whole being, must be dedicated to Christ our King. In the last three verses of Matthew 4, we discover what Christ the King's kingdom of light is like. Matthew writes, Jesus preached the good news and he healed the people. The good news is that Jesus Christ the King has come to defeat the darkness. And we know that Jesus accomplished this goal, this victory through his death and his resurrection. We're all called to be preachers of this good news. We're all called to proclaim Jesus Christ crucified and risen. And sickness, death, disease, these are all results of the darkness of sin and evil that are engulfing our world still today. All the strife that humans face, bodily and spiritually, people like us, these are all symptoms of the root of that darkness. Early in and throughout his ministry, Jesus proved that he could defeat the symptoms of darkness. So he healed the sick, he fed the hungry, he freed the demon-possessed, he raised the dead. And then to prove that his powers were not just mere parlor tricks, Jesus achieved the greatest act that anyone has ever achieved. He died and he rose again. Through death and resurrection, King Jesus defeated the source of darkness. Through death and resurrection, King Jesus defeated the prince of darkness. Jesus proved at the start of his ministry and right on to the end that he is infinitely more powerful than that great enemy. And since Christ's enemy is our enemy, and Jesus wins victory for all who are followers of his. The chapter, chapter 4 of Matthew's Gospel, it ends with more people responding to Jesus. Jesus preaches to and heals people from all throughout that region of Galilee and Judea. What do they do? We read that large crowds follow him. Many people recognize their need for light, and they look to Jesus as that light. Many are willing to follow Jesus Christ, the Messiah King. They can see only partly, but they can see that Jesus is not like the other kings, the other self-professed messiahs who've come along in the past and have failed, utterly failed. They don't fully understand who Jesus is. They don't know what kind of king he is yet. This will come, again, after he dies and rises. After his death and resurrection, these crowds will be very thinned out. Only his true followers will emerge. 
Well, we live after Christ's death and resurrection. We all know who Jesus is. We know what he's accomplished. And so again, the question for each of us is, are we true followers of Jesus Christ the King? Are we true soldiers in Christ the King's eternal and global army? Since our King's resurrection, his army of followers, it's been active, it's been growing. God has blessed the army of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. The true church of Jesus Christ, that is the army of Christ the King. And this army spans the globe. It is reflecting the light of Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, to people living in darkness. Christ's soldiers, they are still answering Christ's call to be fishers of men, fishers of people. By God's grace, many are still coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, their Lord, and their King, and they are following Him. I hope and I pray that that is true of every one of us here, every one of us listening, that we can say with certainty, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I am a soldier in Christ the King's army. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for sending Jesus Christ, God the Son, the light of the world into our world of darkness. We confess that sometimes the darkness overwhelms us. We confess, Lord, that the darkness sometimes steals away our strength, our resolve to live as your people. We confess that at times we try to stay on the sidelines of this war that is going on between you, the light, and the evil one who is the prince of darkness. We confess, Lord, that we try to go along with society so we don't get noticed. We simply fail as being yeah, true followers of Jesus Christ. We're being not always obedient, not always submitting to your rule. We're not trusting in you. We're not persevering when the going gets tough. We confess this, Lord, and we ask that you give us strength, the power of your spirit, to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ, to be faithful soldiers in Christ's army. We pray, Lord, that for all of us we may take up our cross, follow our Savior, no matter what you call us to do. We do it joyfully. We do it with gratitude, knowing that Jesus Christ has triumphed. He has destroyed. He has defeated all our enemies, and he will come back to eliminate them and their effects once and for all when he returns. That's because his kingdom is eternal, because he is the eternal king. We get to be part of that kingdom. We get to live with our king for eternity, but only of our faith is in him only if we seek to follow him as best we can. Lift us up, Lord, if we're struggling. The effects of the darkness are overwhelming us, whether we're dealing with illness, spiritually, physically, emotionally, Lord. Let us see Jesus Christ, the light. Let his light shine into our lives so that we can keep our eyes fixed on him and not be overcome by what's going on around us, this war that's going on around us. So hear our prayer. Pray them in Jesus' name, for he is our faithful king. We look to him and him alone. Amen. Song of response, stand together and sing <clears throat> when the music plays, is facing a task on
Let's turn to God again in prayer, congregational prayer, lift up our hearts to the Lord, trust, believe that God our Father hears us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are our living head. By faith, we are members of your body. We pray that you would teach us to function well as your body here on earth. Let us be your hands, your feet, your eyes, and your compassionate heart to a world that is lost in darkness, the darkness of sin and evil. Lord Jesus, send the impulses of your love into the sinews of your church, our church, our congregation. May your love be our lifeblood, our energy to go forth in the cause of the gospel. May your will and your thoughts direct us. Let your hands through our hands supply food for our neighbor's hunger. Let the people we interact with hear your voice as we visit and we talk with them. Let our families and all that we meet see Jesus in us. Without you as our head, King Jesus, we are lifeless. We are hopeless. And we wait for your power and your word and your instruction. Fill us with your life and your love, we pray, Lord Jesus. And fill us with your spirit. We pray for members of our congregation, of our families who are going through difficult times. We pray for James as he prepares for surgery this week. We pray that it may go well and that after the surgery he'll be given a clean bill of health. We pray for Tom as he waits to hear where he will be moved. We pray, Lord, that in this time of uncertainty, perhaps anxiety, that you will give him and Trusha and the family peace, calm hearts, Lord. We pray for others going through treatment. Pray for those who, who've been told there is no treatment, that they must suffer with what ails them, Lord, and do the best they can. We pray for those who deal with chronic pain, with chronic illnesses, Lord, that if they haven't yet, they have to learn to live with and get along the best they can. We thank you for your word that reminds us that Jesus is the one who is able to heal all our diseases one who is able to conquer all our enemies. We pray that that may happen in this life, Lord, but you don't promise us that. You don't promise to make our life easy here on this side of heaven, but you do promise us an eternity where there is no more pain, no mourning, because there's no death. There is no sorrow. There is no darkness, because there is no sin and evil. So as we journey through life, Lord, give us that perspective that eternal perspective, and to know and believe and trust that if our faith is in you, Lord Jesus, we belong to your eternal kingdom. We will live and reign with you for all eternity. We pray for those who are having good events happening in their life. We thank you with Jason and Kaylee for the safe arrival of Logan. We also rejoice with the Weringas and the Zudemans that another member has been added to their family, Lord, and we thank you that things are going well, and we pray that that may continue. We pray for others, moms who are pregnant, Lord, that you would cause those pregnancies to go well and to full term without any issue. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries, days in the year, Lord, that we hope and pray are reminders of your faithfulness to us, your love for us the giver of life, one who sustains us each and every day. May we not take anything that you give us for granted, especially not the lives that you give us. Thank you, Lord, that Ryan sustained his classical exam yesterday. Thank you that we look forward to his installation, his ordination next week. And we pray, Lord, that 
to be with him, Brianne and the family, Lord, as they can now rest after a long journey of preparation for ministry. Thank you, Lord, for bringing them to a congregation where they can serve you and lead your people there. We just ask that you be with them and go with them, Lord, and surround them with your love and your care. Thank you for this um, joyous occasion and time in their lives. Lord, we, we ask that you be near us. Remind us that you, Lord God, are the one who controls all the seasons, all time, and everything that exists. Remind us, Lord, that you have set your pattern for how your universe should operate. We see your faithfulness. As the sun comes up every day and goes down. The seasons change. Reminders of your great faithfulness to us. Lord, you have ordained that there is a time for keeping, a time for losing, a time for building up, and a time for pulling down. We are in the season of Lent. We Mentally, spiritually, we journey to the cross. In a few weeks, we will go through that story of Passion Week where you willingly gave up your life to suffer and to die in our place. Help us, Lord, to discern in our lives what we must lay down and what we must take up. Help us to see how you want us to follow you in the individual lives that we carry, but also as a community of faith, as a congregation. More greatly as your church, the worldwide church, help us to know what it is we need to focus on and how it is we are to carry out that great commission. Give us your strength and your power so that we may each lead a disciplined life. Give us your grace to live in glad faithfulness and with joy that comes from our salvation and from having a closer walk with Jesus Christ, who is our crucified and risen Savior and King. We hear all our prayers, for we pray them in Jesus' name. The moment the deacons will gather a collect an offering for the general fund, the work that we do, the obligations that we've committed to as a congregation. So you're welcome to give to that. If you're visiting, you don't have to, but we just appreciate your support. While the offering is being collected, we'll remain seated, we'll sing. I am not my own. It's probably a new song to many of you, but we did sing it oh, many months ago, I think. Probably June, wasn't it? So you may remember it from then, but just listen. If you don't feel comfortable singing, if you do feel comfortable, join in.
Shall we pray? Almighty God, we thank you for the many blessings you have given us. Out of our abundance, we now return a small portion to you through these gifts for the general fund. Pray that these funds will be used to do your will, both here in our own church and throughout the denomination. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Following the service, you're invited to a time of fellowship. You're also invited to stay for the soup and bun lunch. Don't leave hungry if you're able. Stay for that. Our final song will be By Faith. Before we sing it, we receive God's parting benediction. May the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in the Lord Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a little while, may he himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast to the end. To him be the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.